It's all about having the key insights, following the leaders of the crypto industry and background stories on blockchain technology trends to keep you one step ahead. Monty Metzger, CEO of LCX.com, keeps you up to speed with what's moving global crypto markets and gives you the latest insights about LCX's platform and ecosystem. This is LCX Insights Live. Welcome to LCX Insights Live. It's another live show here today. I'm reporting here live from our office at LCX, and I'm happy to have you all with us. In this live video show, I'm engaging with the world's top blockchain projects, entrepreneurs, investors, and pioneers in blockchain and crypto in honest conversations meant to challenge traditional ways of thinking. My name is Monty Metzger, and I'm founder and CEO of LCX. LCX is a regulated fintech company that focuses on digital asset trading, compliant token offerings, and tokenization. LCX recently received eight blockchain-related approvals by the Liechtenstein regulator, more than any other company in the country. And Liechtenstein is a country next to Switzerland and Austria in the middle of Europe and has received a AAA rating by um, Standard & Poor's. So that's the highest country rating possible. Liechtenstein has also introduced the most forward-thinking legal framework for cryptocurrencies and blockchain companies, providing legal clarity and security for LCX users. At LCX Insights Live, we are inviting leading personalities, key partners of LCX, and founders or senior management of blockchain projects listed at LCX Exchange. Today, we are talking about blockchain and how blockchain and NFTs are disrupting the gaming industry. Today's guest is from the global leader in blockchain games headquartered in Hong Kong. He has previously been the co-founder and CFO of Redgate Media, a venture-backed Chinese television and outdoor media holding company, which was sold to InnoTech Holdings Limited. He was also the co-founder and chief strategy officer, officer of One Media Group, a Hong Kong-based magazine group. And prior to that, he was the founder and CEO of One Studio, a venture-backed web development company in Hong Kong, and OS Media, a Chinese television advertising sales company. So he began his career at Metro Media Building, where he's building, uh, had been building wireless telecom networks in China and Indonesia. So big background in media, advertising, Chinese and Asian markets. He's now the CEO of Onimoka Brands and Ref Motorsports. Please welcome Mr. Robbie Young. Where are you? Here you are. Hi, Come Monty. On. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, good to see you as well. I'm very excited to have you here on L6 Insights Live. Thank you. Although from the uh, introduction, I just realized I should make the bio a little shorter because it reveals how old I really feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the other hand, you are experienced and especially <laughs> with Europe, Asia and, and giving all your media background, very uh, fascinating to see. H how long are you now CEO at Animoca Brands? Um, since 2014, when we first went public, um, and I've been with the company since since 2012. Um, although, frankly, Yat, who is the co-founder and chairman, and I have have been friends since uh, since we started our first internet companies back uh, in Hong Kong in the mid 90s. Okay, excellent. For our audience, and maybe you can introduce Animoca Brands. What is Animoca Brands? Sure, um, we are primarily an entertainment company. Um, and we're best known for making games. Um, so we've been in the mobile game space um, since 2009, uh, 2010. And then starting in the end of 2017, we moved into the emerging field of blockchain games. And that's been a primary focus for us in terms of you know, new business development and just really the path forward for us um, as we kind of steered the whole ship in the direction of blockchain games because I think we, we recognized at that time that blockchain technology could have a dramatic impact on, on games and on what we did in the gaming mm -hmm. industry. But at the same time, actually, uh, we think the gaming industry will have a big, big impact on blockchain too. So, so we thought it was quite a match. 
Okay, yeah, excellent. I mean, I know that Animoca Brands had been there in like mobile gaming since a very long time. Also, um, had been watching the development of uh, of Hello Kitty back in the days where uh, mm -hmm. you acquired the, the digital rights and these things. So basically, mobile had been a key part in gaming as well. And now there's a new aspect coming in blockchain. <laughs> so, um, there's there's this separate company called Ref Motorsports. Maybe you can mm -hmm. explain what is Ref Motorsports and what's the connection to sure. Animal Brands. So um, one of the first projects that we undertook when we decided to go into blockchain gaming, um, you know, our expertise um, in so-called traditional gaming and mobile particularly has always been working with brands, which is why we put it in the name of, of our company. Um, so we work as a partner to brands where we license those brands and we make entertainment products, games and content based on those licensed products. So that's that's kind of our specialty. As you said, we've worked with brands like Hello Kitty and Garfield and Ultraman, Astro Boy, et cetera. Um, and so we knew that we had um, a strong skill set in partnering with brands. And when we looked at the potential for blockchain games, one of the main themes that we saw in the early adoption phase of blockchain games would be collectability because digital collectability is something that can only be enabled once you have the potential for scarcity or the ability to control the number of units that you're producing. And that's something that blockchain, um, you know, through NFTs gives to games that games have never had before. Um, so we felt that partnering with brands would make a lot of sense. And the first brand that we partnered with was Formula One. So oh, Form exciting, yeah. Yeah, so Formula Tell me One... More about, um, so what is uh, so that's Rev Motorsport is partnering with Formula One, correct? What is it all about? What do you do there? <clears throat> so initially, what we what we announced to the market, you know, when we when we partnered with Formula One, our objective was to create a fantastic game, blockchain game experience based upon Formula One and upon all of the aspects of Formula One. So the cars, the drivers, the tracks, everything people know and love about Formula One. And as we created this game experience, and it, it was quite a unique idea because building a blockchain game allows you to um, uh, create assets that can be truly owned, digital assets that can be truly owned by the players. And that's something that's never, as I said, happened before. And so players can come to F1 Delta Time, which is the name of, of the game, and they can mm -hmm. buy cars, they can own them, they can take them out of the game and they can trade them on marketplaces like OpenSea. Um, there are all kinds of exciting things which we can get into that you can do with your, with your Formula One car. But alongside the creation of that game experience, we created an in-game currency because one of our big beliefs in why blockchain is great for games is that tokens can work very well in two different fashions. On the one hand, there are cryptocurrencies or fungible tokens like uh, which can be used as in-game currency. Um, so ERC-20 tokens, for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, mm -hmm. And then NFTs, which are great for tokenizing the content um, because they can be limited in addition and they can have special attributes to them. And so alongside the NFTs that we created around the cars and the drivers and the car parts, we created an in-game currency called the Rev token. Um, and that was for exclusively using in F1 Delta time. But the plan over time was to then extend the features and the functionality of Rev to make it a cryptocurrency for motorsports enthusiasts. And so now you mm -hmm. can use the Rev token across a variety of other products outside of the F1 Delta time ecosystem. Okay, okay. That sounds exciting. I think you mentioned a lot of things and I want to break it down sure. step by step for the community that they fully understand and really understand the potential um, there. As a, as a side note, so we are engaging um, here live with an AMA. So basically you can ask us anything. You can drop your questions. Um, best is actually to use YouTube, but you could also comment on LinkedIn and Facebook. I think that would also show up here and then we'll pick the best questions. And then we have um, a special award for the best question as well. We have these nice uh, hats. These are from uh, LCX branded from our merch store with at LCX in the side and the, the dollar sign um, hashtag and then um, LCX.com. So I'm 
wearing that now. So you remember to ask questions. We need your questions and the best question will be rewarded from us. So um, let's go back to the, the couple of things you mentioned. Let's start with the basics. Mm -hmm. Robbie, how would you define blockchain gaming? Okay, so blockchain gaming is basically, <clears throat> think of it as, um, I don't know, it's the next generation of gaming. The purpose of a blockchain game is that it's, it's still a game. It's a game and you can have fun and you can go and play and spend time and enjoy yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But the key thing about a blockchain game that makes it different is that the information that you, um, particularly the assets that you play with, are recorded on the blockchain. So they are NFTs. And mm -hmm. this changes the whole principle of a game. Because today, if you go to a traditional game, whether it's on the web or on a console or on uh, mobile, a game is essentially a rental ecosystem. You go into the game, you spend money in the game, you know, you usually use your credit card. So if you have a, let's use Apple as an example, if you have an iTunes account on, a, on an iPhone, you go in, you spend money from your iTunes account, you buy virtual currency in the game, you buy diamonds or gold or something mm -hmm. inside the game and you spend it in the game and you have a really fun time and you enjoy yourself. And you will, you will buy characters and upgrade them, etc. But the key thing is all the money you spend never comes back. It's spent to spend time for enjoyment inside the game. So it's a rental economy. By using blockchain technology in the game, we can change that. We can basically liberate that content so that players can actually own it. Because at the end of the day, the beauty of blockchain is it's permissionless. So those NFTs you know, are truly owned by the users. So how does that work? Mm -hmm. In a game like F1 Delta Time, for example, you go into F1 Delta Time and you buy some rev tokens just the way you would buy in-game currency in any other game. When you buy the rev tokens, you can then spend rev tokens on anything you like in the game. You can buy cars, you can buy drivers, you can even buy sections of track if you want to, of the Monaco GP track. Um, and then owning those assets allows you to play with them in the game. So, so far, just like any other game. However, if you want to take those assets and let's just say, you know, you're tired, you've been racing for months and you're tired of spending your time in F1 Delta time and you want to go do something else. You can then take those cars and drivers that you own, put them up on OpenSea for sale and sell them to somebody else who is new to the game and wants to play. So you can basically cash out and take your money to go and do something else with it because you've, you know, you've spent your time in that game. You want to move on and do something else. So that's, that's the first step at how it's fundamentally different from traditional gaming. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe I'll get into the, uh, the DeFi aspects in a minute. Okay. So I think it's, it's a shift from like the traditional gaming where digital collectibles had already been a big business. In the past, you know, there had been these games where you could buy digital items yes. at special dedicated stores, but they got stuck within the game and, and you could not take them or sell them or trade them or something like that. So now with NFTs, we are freeing this up and Absolutely. You're basically making that independable Absolutely. As, a, as, a, as a full like digital collectible ecosystem. And um, so I think maybe yeah. uh, if I can show you an example, so Fortnite, an extremely popular yes. game from Epic. And one of the things that players love to do in Fortnite is buy skins so that they can customize their avatars and their characters. And so they spend a lot of money in Fortnite buying skins. But the problem is the only thing that they can do with the skins is what Epic, the developer, allows them to do. So if there is a store where you can trade them with other players, you know, through Epic's store, you can do that, but that's it. That's all you're limited to do. You can never take their skins out and put them on eBay or swap it to your friend. It must have the permission of Epic, the developer, to do, mm -hmm. to do something with it. Whereas in the case of F1 Delta Time, you know, you can take your car out, you can sell it, you can trade it, you can, you can destroy it if you want. It doesn't matter. It's up to you because you own it. You've actually bought it. How big is the market for digital collectibles without blockchain and how big is the blockchain nft market as of now okay so the market for digital collectibles is about two billion us dollars um, and those are mostly 
platform specific digital collectibles. Um, you know, so they exist within a certain platform. Um, now it's expanded dramatically because frankly, you know, even if you look just at the incredible success of a game like NBA Top Shot, um, they have already done over a, a billion dollars worth of trading in the last three months. Um, and this is, you know, the first mega success blockchain game title. Um, so I think, you know, we've seen it, the, the growth has been tremendous. Um, according to, I think, nonfungible.com, they said that the trading volume for NFTs in, uh, in um, February of last year of 2020 was $10 million. Um, and this year in February was a billion dollars. So the growth has been extraordinary. Um, and <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think mainly the reason for that is because at the end of the day, the idea of what a game is because of NFTs gets flipped on its head a little bit because a game used to be about the platform and the distribution because all the players come into a game and they're all locked inside the game as this ecosystem. But once the game becomes about the assets, then it's exciting because all the players um, become owners in the game because they own all the assets. And it becomes about us as the developer serving the players and making, giving them a fun environment in which to use their assets. So it, okay. we think it gives a lot more power to the players. So it's, it's not about a platform, but about the gaming network, basically, or ecosystem you're building up. Correct. And building the asset value of those in-game items, because that game mm -hmm. economy Thanks to blockchain, the in-game economy goes from being a, a virtual economy to being an actual economy. Okay, so it's a gaming economy. And I think everybody's wondering how this looks. So let's have a look on what is Ref Token and what you can do with it. You send me this little video and I'm going to show it now. Okay. Rev is a cryptocurrency for our motorsport blockchain games, including F1 Delta Time, MotoGP, and Formula E. So what does that mean, and what can you do with Rev? Think of Rev as the in-game currency that connects together multiple games. One currency, many motorsport games. The difference between Rev and a typical non-blockchain game currency is that the Rev is truly and completely yours. You have absolute control of your Rev and can do anything you want with it. Spend it, hold it, sell it. This important concept of actually owning digital assets is new to gaming and is called true digital ownership. So how does Rev work? Let's take the example of F1 Delta Time. In order to race in F1 Delta Time, you need to get certain digital items. The absolute minimum you need is a car, driver, and tires. These digital items are NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, which we'll explain in another video. Rev allows you to purchase these NFTs, pay race entry fees, and even repair your tires. You can even stake your rev to earn more by doing absolutely nothing. This is somewhat similar to fixed deposit. Last but not least, rev also serves as an in-game reward. For example, winning a race or tournament will reward you with rev. Rev has real value outside of the game because it is listed on multiple exchanges allowing you to trade it. Because it's completely yours, remember true digital ownership, this means that performing well and winning races can actually net you real world profit. This concept is known as play to earn. Okay, so we make a cut here. Play to earn. Yes. Digital ownership, ref token, NFTs, a lot of things. So And don't don't forget staking. <laughs> staking, yeah. So there's there's the ref token. So can you just tell us like summarize again, what is the ref token and then what sure. are the NFTs? I think that it's two separate no problem. things. So the Rev token is the in-game currency of our F1 Delta Time game and other motorsports games like, like MotoGP Ignition and our upcoming Formula E game. But I'll use F1 Delta Time as the example because it's the most mature game that we have developed so far that uses the Rev token. So the Rev token, as Matt was saying in the video there, um, you can use that as the functional, functional in-game currency to buy digital items inside the game. You can buy cars, tires, you use the rev token to enter races. And then when you win races, there's prize money, which is also paid in rev tokens. So that's it's the functional currency inside the game. And then beyond that, we have a lot of features that are enabled inside the game um, because now that the game is tokenized, um, we are able to offer special kinds of functionality that don't exist in traditional games. So for example, if you own one of our F1 cars, which is an NFT, 
um, then you can stake that car, uh, which is a concept that people in, from crypto are quite familiar with. Um, so you basically place the car on deposit with us and you can earn rev tokens um, basically as yield for staking that car. Why do we do this? The reason we do this is because as a game company, we want to offer something to all kinds of players. So there are going to be some players who come to the game and they just want to race because they love racing cars and that's all they want to do. But there are going to be some people who come and are collectors. They love Formula One authentic licensed merchandise. You know, they have signed helmets at home and this kind of thing. And so they may want to come just for the exclusive collectible merchandise. And maybe they have no intention of participating in races. So they can then take the, that merchandise that they own, which are NFTs, and they can stake them and earn yield. And so what do they do with the yield and the rev tokens that they earn? They can spend it on more collectible merchandise if they like, because that's their passion, right? So that way we can cater to them as an audience. Um, so I think there's a lot of different things that, um, you know, we try to offer something for everybody. Um, on the play to earn side, then that's actually something different. That's for people who really want to participate in racing because thanks to the fact that, you know, the rev token is tradable on, on many exchanges, including LCX, of course, um, it allows players when they participate in races and win to um, earn from the prize pool. So we have a weekly prize pool and you can enter as many races as you like over the course of the week. And the prizes are, you know, very generous by game standards. People are earning literally, you know, the equivalent of thousands of dollars a week um, participating in races. Um, don't forget, you have to win. <laughs> so that's the important okay. part. So it's not for everybody who enters. You need to win races and be good at driving. Um, but for people who win, um, this changes, I think, the, um, you know, the idea of esports, um, mm -hmm. where esports in traditional gaming is monetized through prize money from sponsorship. Whereas because this is on the blockchain, prize money can actually be earned directly kind of almost peer to peer because the prize pools are in rev, you drive and you earn rev directly. We don't have to have sponsors to participate in the process. Okay, yeah. Can, can you give us a breakdown on when you launch rev token, when you mm. launch the, the first game and platform and where do you stand in terms of numbers, reach and kind of data you can share with us? Mm. Okay, so we started launching um, the first NFTs for the game in 2019. Um, and I think one of the things that's quite interesting about launching a blockchain game is that because you can have true digital ownership of the content, you can actually start um, you know, building some interest and momentum for the game in advance of launching the full game experience. And we could sell some of the cars and we auctioned many collectible cars over the course of the summer of 2019 um, and the, the last winter between 2019, 2020. Um, and some of those you know, were quite notable. So for example, the first F1 car we sold, which we called the number 111, um, sold for a record price. It was actually the highest price paid for, a, for an NFT in 2019. Um, it was 419 ETH, I think, at the time, something like that. Um, and, uh, and actually sold uh, to the same, uh, same individual who, paid, uh, who bought the uh, first uh, Beeple 5,000 days from, from Christie's recently that attracted a lot of headlines. Um, and <clears throat> so we, we began selling uh, collectible merchandise in 2019. The full game experience launched last summer. Um, and so people have been able to participate in time, time trials and full races on Formula One Delta time. Um, and the Rev token also launched in the summer of 2020. Um, and we're pleased to say that it's, it's seen a reasonable amount of success since launch. Um, obviously, it's performed well. Um, you know, that said, most crypto has done quite well recently, which is good for everybody in the industry. Um, and I think most importantly, our focus has always been on utility. Because the more you can do with Rev, in our opinion, the more value it will be. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're not interested in coming into the, the blockchain game business to create tokens that people just buy and hold. Because that's, a, that's not our business. That's, you know, that's why you buy Bitcoin or other types of cryptocurrencies. For us, it's about creating utility because we think utility naturally imparts value to a token. So the more you can do with it, 
we think the more valuable it, it becomes to the user. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, exciting. I think like you launched a token summer and now um, like the game, do, do you see traction coming from the token itself as well that people are yes. actually coming from the token and then discovering the game? Or is it the other way around that they're coming from the game and then discovering the token? I think I think the great part is it actually goes in both directions because I think mm -hmm. that because we're in this you know funny new niche called blockchain gaming, we actually attract audiences who come from like with F1 Delta Time, for example. We attract audiences of gamers who just like racing games. We attract audiences of F1 fans who just like F1, and we attract crypto people who are like. Oh, this is a really cool use of crypto because I have Bitcoin and you know Ether and other cryptocurrencies. But here's a way that I can use crypto and play games. That's kind of cool. What's this? So I think it's a wonderful sort of intersection of lots of different kind of enthusiast um, bubbles, so to speak, or circles. Okay, let's have a look at the at the token. So I just opened up um, here Coin Gecko surprise. Mm -hmm. So the token is listed. Uh, on several exchanges, you're ranked uh, 558 at the moment, like 52 million yes. market cap. Um, and then when we look at the, the exchanges, there uh, there's a Uniswap pair, uh, there's KuCoin listing, Bittrex, and then there are two pairs at LCX exchange as well. So we are currently trading RAF LCX and we're trading RAF BTC uh, at the moment as well. So. I think we're in the middle range in terms of trading volume at the moment. Not uh, the, the the highest trading volume, I think, is is clearly here on uh, on Uniswap and then um, what's that? Balexi. Um, who who knows if this is a real volume? But Uniswap um, for sure. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we are excited to have you there, and I think we did uh, talk about uh, a general partnership. Uh, with Rev Motorsports a, a while ago, we mm. started out also with the Uniswap uh, pair to as an experiment to do Rev uh, LCX a token on Uniswap and, mm -hmm. and tried that out for a while. Um, and now we close this pair again and focus fully on the LCX exchange mm -hmm. uh, trading pair there. But th th there was already a lot of attention at the beginning, so I think the the partnership overall was was very exciting for us to learn. Uh, and to see uh, what else we could do together in the NFT space. Um, and there's actually one question uh, here coming in from uh, from the community. So hmm. let's uh, read it out from Fi Fight Oma. Um, are there any plans to integrate Animoca NFTs into LCX ecosystem? Robbie, what can we tell uh, about this? Um, I, I'd say I would never rule anything out. I think the thing that is the thing that is so fascinating to me is that um, the fact that assets in the game are tokenized, so not just the Rev token but also the NFTs, gives us the possibility that that could happen. And I think that's really exciting. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of NFT trading happens for game assets today on OpenSea. Um, I think because they were the they were the first marketplace to really focus on NFTs. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, these are very open and flexible assets, and I, I um, definitely foresee uh, um, cooperating with all different kinds of exchanges in the future. Yeah. So for us, we currently focus on like traditional spot trading with the Rev token as a utility token. But obviously, the whole NFT space is super exciting for us at LCX as well. And uh, we had been discussing a couple of concepts with with Animoca Brands, with you and and Yat, the chairman of Animoca Brands, uh, for several times. Um, and it, it's it's something where we, like we want to do something and i think it's nothing is defined at this point of time mm -hmm. in terms of with animoca brands but um we're we're evaluating what we can do how many nfts are now traded on OpenSea or other third party marketplaces how do many nfts that? um like we from, don't but actually from, mm -hmm. but actually you can track that on um there are several there's crypto slam is actually a good place where you can track nft trading volumes um so it's mm -hmm. a little bit like a like a coin gecko coin market cap for nfts just for nfts um, although they only focus on some uh, um, uh, narrow very narrow token standards so i think we're still waiting for a good um, data source for the nft industry as a whole um, 
that said, to be honest, don't forget that the NFT industry literally was born in December of 2017. So we're not very old yet. <laughs> we've yeah. just, we've, we've just, I think, had a lot of good fortune this year. You know, we got off to a very good start, um, which is fantastic. Um, but I do think that it is the beginning of something very big because I think that when we think, you know, we're blockchain enthusiasts and evangelists and we think that, you know, it, crypto is something that, that is going to be a part of everybody's life going forward. Yeah. But in order to become part of the mainstream, um, our belief is that entertainment products will really help assist that because for the average everyday person, you know, um, they're not necessarily going to be thinking about investing in crypto or something. They're just, you know, going about their daily lives. And um, so for them, you know, an entertainment product may be a way to onboard them to crypto. And games are a very good way to do that. Because now, you know, as we've seen, people originally bought an iPhone or a smartphone to make telephone calls. But it took about one year, I think, maybe, maybe less, for it to primarily become a gaming device and a social media device. Um, so I think, you know, when we talk about where the next billion people coming into crypto will come from, we think that they'll come through games. Okay, so it's about uh, mass adoption and gaming it could really yes. um, trigger that and, and drive the mass adoption of blockchain because people love to, to play around and there's nothing, it's not kind of serious money involved, but you can play to earn and you can spend it and, and there's kind of a whole ecosystem around it. Well, Robbie, here, here's, a, here's a, sorry, like, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Yeah. Just one quick thought, which is, If I remember correctly, there are probably now somewhere between 25 and 30 million wallets in existence in the world. Um, True. And if you think about it, um, NBA Top Shot onboarded half a million new wallets in the first quarter of this year. And so that's just one game title, albeit a phenomenally successful game. But mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about the impact they've had on bringing half a million people who never thought about crypto before, but really loved basketball and trading cards. And they said, okay, well now I have a, a crypto wallet because I like basketball. And so all of a sudden now they could also go on and buy other tokens from other exchanges because now they're part of the crypto ecosystem. So I think that that's a very powerful idea. Absolutely, yeah. So the crypto ecosystem is evolving. And uh, ultimately, um, we are today talking about the topic about how blockchain and NFTs are disrupting the gaming industry. How would you answer to this? Um, so I think we believe we're disrupting the game in, gaming industry because we think we're unlocking value um, because the gaming industry is um, the biggest entertainment industry that, that people don't really think about. You know, everybody thinks about film and, and TV and, and music. But actually, the gaming industry by revenue, it will be about $200 billion dollars this year. And it makes it bigger than filmed entertainment and music all put together by far. Um, and, and you only have to go as far as to think, you know, what games you yourself play or people you know play to realize that actually everybody on Earth plays games now, thanks, thanks to mobile devices. Um, and so I think, you know, this will have big impacts for the game industry because if I think about spending money in a game, Say I have a, you know, a, a budget, as everybody does, maybe I spend $20 a month in a game, right? And I, with my iTunes or something like that. Um, but I don't get anything back. Every month I spend $20 and I play in the game and I have fun. So that's my entertainment cost. Mm -hmm. But if I owned those assets in the game and at the end of the month, I could sell them. And let's just, let's leave aside the fact that the value of the assets may go up. Put that aside. Let's just assume they don't go up and they go down. It has to be worth something because I could sell my assets to somebody new coming in the game. So let's just say I make 10 cents on the dollar back selling my assets, okay? So I can recoup something because something is better than nothing. Hmm. If I can recoup that, maybe then my thinking is, okay, when I go and play a new game, instead of $20 a month, I'll spend $25 a month because I know I will get something back. So all of a sudden, I've increased my spending in games by 25%. And if I do that, and the whole world does that, we've just created $50 billion dollars of game market cap, industry rather. Okay, so basically, also the early um, players could be the evangelists 
to get more users and then they they're getting rewards absolutely back from others, others joining and well, i think that one that's thing to power think about. like if you're really passionate about the game and bring in all your friends then yes. you automatically get get kind of rewarded because the value goes up the ecosystem grows absolutely because if you think about it you know if you own assets in a game like f1 delta time for example if you own cars or drivers and you can get you know let's make something up a thousand friends to come and play the game and the game becomes more fun and more people are buying stuff in the game the value of the cars you own will go up naturally because there's a bigger marketplace there are more fans so i think it's great that when you build a great fan community and a player community inside a game that that community actually can then benefit because if you look at traditional games when a fantastic community is built in the game usually the developer benefits it's kind of a feudal system right yes. but blockchain games are much more democratized because actually we have governance tokens in games and you know we're doing an experiment with with a token we have called tower um, where we've created a governance token so the idea is that players can vote on the future of the game um, and so these are just you know these are ideas that we're pulling from what we learn from the crypto community and thinking, how could we use this in games? Because it's a, it's a cool tool. And what mm -hmm. can we do to make, play, make it more fun for players? Because at the end of the day, you know, as long as there is trading volume and people enjoy playing and, and buying stuff, we will still make money. But as a game developer, we don't need to make all the money. We believe that if we can grow the community and the ecosystem, we will all benefit ourselves included. Absolutely. So I think now it's time to open up to the, the community. So just a reminder, you can win this cap. It's really nice, like 3D layer of the LCX logo. Um, really good, high quality. And I will ship it to uh, worldwide, like wherever you are. You'll get uh, this uh, cool LCX cap. Um, so let's see, what are the questions here? Um, so first one here from... Uh, Ike Sumper, uh, what is the long-term commercial value of NFTs in, rapid, in the rapidly changing gaming industry? How would you sure. answer to that, Robbie? So I would say that um, the most important thing is that the NFTs are forever. Um, so a key aspect of, um, for very, very um, strong fans who, <clears throat> you know, if you love to play a game and you play it for years, Usually mm -hmm. what happens is that eventually the game stops being profitable enough for the developer to keep supporting it after a certain number of years. And so eventually the game will wind down. And for the hardcore players who want to play for more than five years or something like that, then their assets will also disappear once that game is shut down. So the nice thing is that you know um, the NFTs will outlast any game because that's a fact. They will always exist on the blockchain, they're permanent. Um, but I think the other part of it is that <clears throat> um, those can always be traded over time. So as I said, whether the, whether the price goes up or the price goes down, um, you know, you have those assets have value. And as long as there is a community, then there is an interest from developers to support the community by making experiences for them to play. So I'll give you something, a, a cool example. If you take a, your F1 Delta Time car today, you can go to NiftyFi and pledge it to get a DeFi loan in exchange for that car. And so that's a financial service. But the cool part is that it had nothing to do with us. That's a service that they created based on securitizing our NFT, in a manner of speaking, because they'll take it as, a, as, a, as collateral. And I think that's great because that kind of innovation can only happen because we have open permissionless assets. And that's what's so exciting, I think, about, about you know, when you bring blockchain and, and gaming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the gaming industry, I think it's right that at some point games are kind of uncool and nobody plays them anymore and there's a life cycle of a game. And then the, what we now see are retro games again, like Pong or things from Atari really getting mm -hmm. a lot of hype again. So... Obviously, there might be trading activity even then yes. in this non-hype cycle. And then it comes up again or you do a 2.0 version or whatever. 
But of course, there is the risk that uh, at some point interest will fall down. But I think Rev Motorsport is not the only game you're doing. Well, and um, the thing, the thing also, one thing I forgot to mention actually, because we focused a lot on Rev, is that one, the other part about NFTs, aside from being able to truly own them, of course, that makes them exciting, is that there is the possibility of interoperability. And so, provided that the developers cooperate, you can bring your NFTs from one game to another, which means that NFTs can live on forever, um, not just because they're on the blockchain, but because they may have utility you know, from one game to the next. So, for example, you know, maybe one game lasts for five years, and then the developer stops supporting it and, um, and then creates a new game but you can bring all your old NFTs into the new game because it makes mm -hmm. sense when you create the new game, you want to bring the old community into the new game because maybe, you know, graphics get better and you can just create a better, build a better version 2.0 of the game. But those NFTs will still have value and can come into the new game, even though they might look, you know, on, they're only uh, whatever 4k instead of 16k or 32k graphics or whatever we have in the future. Right. Um, but the nice thing is that they'll still be able to to work in the new environment. Okay, yeah. I also saw that um, you did issue Rev, but there also had been uh, plenty of other activities from Animoca Brands. As you mm -hmm. are the CEO of Animoca Brands, can you summarize what kind of other tokens you have issued? Sure. And what are they all about? And when uh, are there more coming? Or what's the plan over there? Yes. So. <clears throat> We firmly believe, you know, in the value of tokenizing not just the in-game assets as NFTs, but also the in-game currency of the game so that we can help to facilitate all the transactions in a game. So uh, we have other games besides F1 Delta Time and MotoGP Ignition, which use the Rev token. We have a game called The Sandbox, um, which is a metaverse, uh, and that has a token called the Sand token inside. Um, mm -hmm. We also have um, a, uh, a series of games, actually. We have a game company um, here in Europe called Gamey, and they specialize in hyper-casual games. And they've recently launched a Gamey token. Um, and that is a slightly different idea um, because they use the Gamey token as a play-to-earn reward mechanism for playing traditional games. And so we're bringing the two worlds of traditional games together with a reward incentive mechanism and play to earn mechanics um, of the gamey token. Uh, we have also the LMT token, uh, which we've launched, um, which is a migration from previously what was called Limpo. Um, and this is a, a cooperation we ha we've had for many years um, to build content around uh, sports and fitness. And so there the theme is all around sports and health and fitness. Um, because it's important, we think that, you know, the idea behind launching these utility tokens is that they have um, they have a specific purpose, and there is an affinity for an audience who has an uh, an interest in a particular kind of content because that's important. And then you mentioned Tower. Yes, and Tower. Um, and so Tower we created specifically. Um, it's called Tower because it's for tower defense games. And so we created this uh, around a successful franchise of games we have called Crazy Defense Heroes and Crazy Kings. And the idea is similar to Gamey's token, where we're using it as an incentive mechanism. Um, we're creating NFTs that you can buy with Tower. Um, and the idea is that it's a governance token, essentially, for a traditional um, uh, tower defense game series. OK. So to sum this up, um, you did a REV a token, you mm -hmm. did a LIMPO or LMT, there's the Tower token, there's the Gamey token. Did I mention And SAND. Before? Oh, yeah, and SAND. So we also had Sebastian um, yes. here in the LLCX Insights Live recently. Um, yeah, perfect. So five, five tokens and five ecosystems. So... Uh, if I look at the, the blockchain gaming industry, you're truly a, one of the key leaders there, and um, there might be even more coming out. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. But um, let's dive into the question. So uh, there's here one question from Canadian Swiss Alex uh, Creations. What is going on with LMT? So th I think that's a typical question from <laughs> a community. Like, I bought this token. What's going on? Up and down. 
Well, hopefully yeah, Canadian, Canadian Swiss Alex creations should, should be happy because LMT has been performing well as far as I'm aware. Um, and, and yes, we're, we're constantly in, in a development cycle of creating new content. Uh, and so we have um, recently launched new content around LMT where we're working with um, actually well-known athletes uh, to create collectibles based upon their athletic careers. Um, and so that's, that's been the recent focus for LMT. Exciting. Next question. Brandon Goldman. I know MotoGP will be on Flow blockchain instead of Ethereum. Do you yes. think this will be a better or like more popular since they avoid Ethereum gas fees? So we are big supporters of, of the folks at Dapper Labs. Um, we are, full disclosure, a, a shareholder of Dapper Labs. Um, and we've been working closely with them since CryptoKitties back in the, in the dawn of blockchain gaming. Um, we decided, you know, we've made, we have a strategic partnership with them and we decided to put MotoGP Ignition on Flow um, specifically because we wanted to, ex number one, experiment because we like to work with many different chains um, and definitely gas fees on Ethereum are an issue because the game industry is um, very egalitarian. We want to be able to offer things at, at all price points for players. And so gas fees have become a concern, frankly, because, you know, when you have to spend 20 or $30 on a transaction, um, it doesn't make sense for lower priced NFTs at that point. So it kind of ends up pricing the game out of reach for many players. And that's something that, that we, we don't want um, because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we have something for everybody. And so we're experimenting with Flow because um, the team at Dapper has had a, a fantastic um, run of it on Flow so far. Um, you know, it's recently launched. Um, and so this is, this is our first project on Flow. Exciting, yeah. Let's take another question um, from here. Stav Rocks Owl, um, what do you... Uh, what you do is very smart. Uh, is a very smart project that was missing from the gaming industry. Do you have any plans on going at other game genres like first-person shooter or RPG, etc.? Or are you only focusing on mm. racing? Uh, we <laughs> already mentioned a few, but yes. what are what are the other plans and genres? Um, so, uh, so definitely, definitely, we will be moving into other genres, um, and we do have games in other genres. Um, so, for example, we have. Um, a handful of AAA console and mobile titles from our studio in California called Enway, um, featuring uh, brands like WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment, mm -hmm. um, and also the Power Rangers. Um, however, those uh, titles have not yet been brought to blockchain. Um, those are traditional game titles. Um, but I think they should give you some hint that uh, we do have intentions to, to move into other categories as well, for sure. Um, we're, we're working as quickly as we can. And um, related to that, from Fried Oma again, are there any new games from Money Mocha in the pipeline? I'm looking for triple uh, <clears throat> role play or MMOPRG games. Yes. Like that. So I think the first thing to say is um, yes, definitely we have ambitions to add other titles in other genres, as I said. Um, that said, we are in uncharted territory. Um, building a blockchain game is complex and it takes time um you know the one thing as i mentioned earlier that's been very interesting is when you talk about creating an in-game economy you have to have advice from real economists when it is a blockchain game <laughs> because it's an actual economy um and so uh you know it takes time because we're we're blazing new trails here there are not a lot of blockchain games out in the market um and it's early days so we're mm. definitely working on it but but give us a little bit of time You're mentioning economy, and there's another question around this from Chris Keynes. Mm -hmm. Fast development of internet games and e-games that generates a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, are you not afraid of the in interest of governance to regulate and recover more taxes? Is it a danger for you as a business? Oh, What would okay. you answer? So, um, obviously, you know, we pay lots of taxes in many, many countries. That's part of our business. And, and no, it's not a concern for us because actually we welcome regulation. I mean, I think if anything, um, we would love to have more clarity on regulation when it comes to blockchain gaming um, because many of the areas we operate in are relatively new still. And, that, and I think that's true for, for the wider crypto industry at the same time. Um, and so I think more 
clarity and also harmony amongst regulations in various countries would actually make it easier for multinationals like ourselves uh, to operate. Okay. And um, I think we welcome regulation as well. You know, at LCX, we had been investing a lot into the regulatory framework. And uh, from our perspective, the LCX or the Liechtenstein regulations really standing out because it's not only regulating one piece of the puzzle, but the whole token value chain from token generation to price services to identity service provider to the exchange uh, itself. So the issuing of tokens is now can be done in a fully compliant manner. And um, how did you issue uh, the tokens, um, the five you mentioned, mm. and, um, and, and the most recent ones? Uh, how? What do you mean how, in terms of how? Um, so some of them we did initial exchange offerings. Some okay. of them, like t uh, like Tower, was kind of a you know a stealth uh, offering because we we put we put a pair on Uniswap and we just let the community um, you know go at it and see whether people uh, enjoyed our idea and decided to start trading. Um, so we've done it in in different fashions, um, and I think we'll continue to experiment with ways to build community because at the end of the day games are all about building community because the reason you play a game these days is for the community not just for the single player game experience and another question from the community about all these games is here from Esther um, and she's asking is there going to be a token that you can use across all your games good question so um, I would say in the short term no, only because um, you know the beauty of, of crypto at this point is there are so many opportunities for you to exchange your tokens um, and the ability to, to exchange them, whether it's on Uniswap or on an exchange, um, is very easy. So um, moving from one to another, I think it's good because it allows people to be able to hold a utility token that represents their own interests and then if they want to change to something else they can move to that thing instead okay so um and is there any um exchange or swap or possible or anything there people can change raft to limpo yes or so what we do what we do do is we also offer um we put pools on uniswap for example um to pair uh sand and rev and you know our tokens various tokens together um the other thing we do is also we try to make it fun for the community so sometimes we'll offer nft prizes and rewards for um you know supplying to those those token pairs um, so, for example, if you own multiple uh, currencies across the Animoca Brands family, um, then you can stake uh, in multiple currencies and get special rewards because at the end of the day, we want people to have fun at the same time. It's not just, you know, if people make money by investing in tokens or NFTs, that's great. But the main thing is that they should have fun because we're an entertainment company. Um, and so if we can make the aspect of trading tokens fun as well as playing games, why not? So it's about having fun, about um, spending your entertainment uh, leisure time. But sometimes games are also important to get information across or can be edu have educational purposes. And I think this, this is a very good question here from Morask. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to support educational games that could maybe incentivize learning by earning tokens? Ah. A so, school uh, that gives you that pays you wouldn't that we be have great? a we have a the we have a theory on this one in house um, and our theory is this our theory is that block if you look at today you know kids spend so much time playing games I mean I have to say I uh, I was the first gener I'm amongst the first generation you know generation X that grew up on video games because you know I started out with with Pong which was the dawn of video games and. <clears throat> And yet, you know, the amount of time I spent playing games as a kid is nothing compared to today, because when I played video games as a kid, it was a single player experience. Today, it's how kids socialize. You know, they may be playing games, but actually they're chatting with their friends while they're playing games. So it's their socialization time. And so kids are doing a lot of their learning in games. And we at Animoca Brands have a belief in-house that because blockchain games um, teach you financial literacy, 
then this will have a very important impact for people who participate in these games. Because unfortunately, particularly in Western society, um, you know, I think a lot of us are brought up to not talk about money a lot because it's considered something you don't talk about at the dinner table or things like that. There's not a lot of openness often. Um, and so we don't always have the same kind of financial literacy um, you know, as we could if we benefited from a more open discussion. But once you get into a blockchain game where there's a real economy going on and you have to learn about staking and yields and all of these different ideas, um, these are, you know, they're, they're not easy concepts. They can be mastered with a little bit of time, but um, learning your way through them actually, I think, is very educational um, and will be great for our players, especially younger players. Yeah, I like the idea as well. Like um, earning while learning something um, is, is uh, I think, an exciting concept. I know in Denmark, it is that the universities actually paying their students a thousand dollars or something if you go and study at a university i think that's a, a smart approach because the students can really focus on then studying and not having a second job or something and then at the same time you had been mentioning the financial education that is missing in, in most countries i think a lot of people are learning it the hard way if we look at countries like turkey Uh, where like the inflation is super high and everybody's fleeing in Bitcoin and then there are no proper exchanges and now they're uh, where they can where they can trade but uh, and then other kind of countries Venezuela we see a, a big shift mm -hmm. um, there uh, question from from my side you are based in Hong Kong but are you serving um, what kind of nations are you serving are you also active mm -hmm. in China uh, um, so we we serve a global audience um, you know, To the extent that uh, people are able to participate and play in the games, um, so I, you know there is regulation over the buying of cryptocurrencies in some countries, and so obviously in those countries, you know people have to obey their local regulations. Um, but our games are available on the web, um, and so obviously anybody with internet access um, is able to access them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that's really fascinating about the whole. Um, blockchain game NFT revolution is that it's one of the first big tech revolutions that is not really based just around Silicon Valley. It's really a global Correct. phenomenon yeah. where if you were to pick the top 10 or 20 companies in the space, they literally come from everywhere in the world. They come from Asia, from Europe, from Latin America. I mean, even ourselves, we have studios in all those parts of the world. Um, and so it's really democratizing um, people's access to, to technology and, and these capabilities. There's another community question here from Chris Keynes. Games can also be very addic addictive. Mm -hmm. Is there action taken by Animoca to avoid or mitigate that effect, or is it uh, not a problem for you at all? Um, it's not something that we found so much as, a, as an issue in our in, uh, industry. I think... Um, You know, when people think about gaming addiction, usually they, they talk about gaming in the sense of gambling, as, which is also sometimes called gaming. Um, but in our sense, you know, as we always tell people, we're, we're about entertainment and about having fun. Um, and so I think, you know, that's the most important thing. And, and when people ask me, because they do, because I'm in the business, they're like, oh, you know, should I buy NFT art? Should I buy Bitcoin? And, you know, I, I tell them, look, you spend what you can afford and, and have fun. Because, you know, NFT art is the same as any art in the world. You have to like the way it looks first. <laughs> and it's not just mm -hmm. about speculating and making money because as long as you enjoy it when it hangs on your wall or on your, on your monitor, then that's the most important thing. So let's have a look at uh, another question from my side. Um, what is the roadmap, the product roadmap of Ref Token in particular and Ref Motorsports? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea behind Rev is that we want it to be um, a utility token for a motorsports ecosystem. And so we began with F1 Delta Time. We've extended it to MotoGP Ignition. Um, we will be extending it also to Formula E, which we have licensed and are creating a game for. However, we don't want to limit it just to Animoca Brands products either, because we want it to have as much utility as possible. So we formed a partnership with Crypto Motors, for example. So you can buy Crypto Motors NFTs uh, with Rev. 
and we formed uh, a partnership with um, uh, what is it called undone watches um, so we have rev themed watches that you can buy that have linked nfts to them um, because we want people to just be able to do cool stuff that's related to motorsports um, you know obviously with MotoGP in there we're not being fussy of whether it's two wheels or four wheels we just want motorsports fans to be able to you know use their rev and earn rev um, and be able to spend it on fun stuff that has to do with their passion Okay, and then the kind of final question for this LCX Insights Live. What do you see the, the key most important trends of the industry and blockchain gaming uh, as a whole? Like, can you name three most important trends? <laughs> three most important trends. Okay, um, I think that we are going to be seeing soon um, a big expansion of uh, new games coming out because, I've, as I mentioned earlier, games take a long time to develop. And so I think what you'll see is the huge amount of interest in the space that's been generated by the success of NBA Top Shot and many other NFT projects in the first quarter of this year will result in a big influx of capital and new entrants into the sector. And so nine months or a year from now, you will start to see products as a result of that. So I think that mm -hmm. means that 2022 is going to be massive for this segment because people are now rapidly making their investments because they're saying, oh, look, there's something here. Now we've got to get into it. And so I think there's a lot of scrambling now for people to go and do that, which is great because honestly, you know, whether it's competition or whatever, as long as there are more people coming into the sector and building the ecosystem, that's great for us and for everybody in it. So I think you're going to see a lot more activity in the next 18 months. Um, I think you're going to see also, um, it's going to be interesting that there are going to be uh, a lot more people just generally participating in the crypto ecosystem. Um, and now that it's gained a lot more mainstream attention, I think people are actually paying attention to what happens because it's not just about oh, the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum, what's happening with the price. Um, now they're thinking about, oh, well, there's you know, artwork, there are games, there are lots of other things related to this industry. So maybe I should be paying attention to it, not just about speculating on the price of Bitcoin. Um, because I think for the crypto industry in general, maybe it's gotten kind of, um, it's been overlooked because the mainstream public just sees the price of Bitcoin because that's usually all that's talked about on the regular news. Okay, yeah, good answer. Um, I think the overall growth you mentioned, the size of investments which are going into the industry, and then ultimately this will drive adoption because there will be more and more games coming out. Yes, well, I, and I can tell you, here's a, a really easy example. So two companies in the space that, that we have, that we're shareholders in, both Dapper Labs and OpenSea have recently announced funding rounds you know, with valuations in excess of, of a couple of billion dollars. Um, and these are companies that are, you know, most people in the general public had never heard of before three months ago. Um, so I think that's yeah. a great signal for the industry. Absolutely. It's a great signal and also shows that the best is yet to come. Uh, for I think sure. We're still at the beginning. You said it's, it's still early days of blockchain gaming. But eventually, the whole gaming industry could really bring blockchain and crypto to mass adoption yes. with wallet integration. I mean, there are many games who are played by hundreds of millions of users. And repeating your words, we probably are at 30 million active uh, wallets or something like that. So still, the early days, of course, the last six months had been very exciting in terms of growth, lots of new users coming in. But still, like we are not at a billion uh, users using this and I think with the gaming um, industry you get a little bit away from having an immediate impact that you need a certain yield or there's a money involved or something it's more fun and entertainment and I think these are all very important and good aspects you have mentioned during our LCX Insights live and um, I'm well here's, very, here's like, a funny thing to think about excited to be um, that, that you have been here yeah Here's a funny thing to think about, which is, uh, which is, you know, the iPhone came out in 2008 um, and people forget that Angry Birds didn't even launch until 2011. It took three years before Angry Birds came out and that's the first game that people really remember. And then Android didn't launch until 2012. 
So, and, and these are, you know, technologies that were backed by the biggest companies on earth. Um, and so when you think about where we are in blockchain games, you know, the NFT was literally invented in December of 2017 and mm -hmm. CryptoKitties was the first game. And up until 2019, there were basically like four games in the market and that's it. Um, so yeah. it's very early days. I think we haven't, you know, with with uh, NBA Top Shot, we may have seen our first Angry Birds, um, but it's just the very beginning. Absolutely, yeah. So we've seen the iPhone generation, the emerging people with smartphones um, who uh, have not even seen a fax machine or something like that. They went all in mobile yes. doing this. And now we see kind of the crypto generation really who are adopting to mobile money and uh, wallets and digital payments naturally. And I think they will demand a token from the big gaming companies and they want to see a PlayStation token or uh, Xbox token. And maybe it's even developed by Animoca brands. Who knows? I think that the future is very bright and it was uh, super exciting to have you with us here at this evening chat. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Um, many greetings to the rest of the team. And then thank you. Soon. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks, Monty. Thank you, everyone. This is LCX Insights Live. For more insights, please visit lcx.com forward slash insights and follow us on Twitter at LCX.